The following presentation of City Cinematheque is made possible in part by the cooperation of the Czech Center of New York, the National Film Archives, Prague, and the State Fund for Cinematography of the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic. Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to present the 1983 production from the Czech Republic, Very Late Afternoon of the Fawn, directed by Vera Hitalova. This is a film that shows, once again, Hitalova's incredible eye for the portrayal of her native Czech society, and more specifically, for Prague. It also shows off her extraordinary formal skills, particularly in camera work and editing. But more than anything else, it shows her supreme satirical skills in representing a very aged but very pompous seducer. We'll be talking about that and a whole set of other things pertinent to Hitalova's work after today's screening. It's a pleasure to welcome back to City Cinematheque Professor Linda Bunsen of Williams College. Now, male egotists, beware. Watch out for the sly, sharp satire of Very Late Afternoon of the Fawn. Welcome back to City Cinematheque. Uh, since you've just met the Angel of Death, it would seem to be appropriate for us to discuss that and a number of other things. I hope you enjoyed today's screening of Very Late Afternoon of the Fawn, uh, a film rarely screened in the United States and uh, I think very much worthy of getting to being known better. Before we talk about the film specifically, it's a pleasure to welcome back to City University Television, Professor Linda Bunsen. Uh, Linda teaches at Williams College in uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts. Um, she is, has taught a number of courses on modern European film, the representation of women uh, in film. She's widely published on Bergman, Bertolucci, and issues of women filmmakers themselves, uh, and is about to spend a sabbatical year finishing her second book on an issue concerning 20th century American artists, women artists, her second book on Sylvia Plath. Welcome back, Linda. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's start with the male character in this film made by a distinguished European woman uh, filmmaker. What strikes you about the choice of this character um, that a woman filmmaker would choose him as her protagonist? What are some of his salient right. features? Well, it's, it's somewhat surprising when you think of the amount of sympathy that she gives him. Um, even though he is indeed satirized, there's a way in which he's caught between these young bimbos, you know, right. who you get little clips of at the beginning and um, various vignettes where he seems to be trying to seduce them, but caught between female characters who are treated with equal satire and these uh, aging women, um, right. the landlady or at least uh, one of his fellow apartment dwellers who keeps talking about him as a buffoon. Yes, indeed. Uh, the two elderly women who arrive with, with the donuts and he's forced to treat in a courtly fashion, much against his will, I suspect. And then his boss, who seems to have um, developed a healthy interest in him as a, a, a potential husband, a potential lover. She's, and she's also, of course, the, the grim reaper at the end who arrives to shuttle him off and into some nightmare. Well, one of the things that strikes me about this is that uh, this is a, a portrait of a man that's not exclusively an exteriorized portrait of him, that we really get to know not only who he is and what he does, 
Uh, and we can talk about that. That's well, we don't really get to know what he does. I mean, he has this job where he's okay. continually looking for a file on Morocco and finds it very opportunely after his secretary has put it underneath his, his well, it's not clear whether the cushion there is there for his hemorrhoids or not, <laughs> but finds it literally under his, his, uh, his behind. But what he's doing at this firm, it, it seems to be a kind of bureaucratic joke that Hitelova is having at the expense of her countrymen. He's obviously doing nothing most of the time. And it's not clear that his secretary is either, so. Well, uh, so we don't really know what yeah. he does, but you're right. He soliloquizes, you know, because he the acting is really extraordinary because he talks to himself continually, yes. and that could be extremely awkward in a film. I mean, that's really a kind of theatrical uh, device for an audience to get to know a character. But it seems natural to him because he's so self-conscious. You know, where he he's so upset when he steps in some doggy do at one point and. Um, exclaiming that one day, oh, I, I must fall in love today. Um, he's, he's sort of continually self-dramatizing. Yes. That's a strong element in his character. And his self-absorption and self-consciousness make the the soliloquizing seem natural to him. It seems to be part of his... his um, well, that's also part of the, the, the way in which the fil film builds its sympathy for him. That is, we're allied with his subjective always. experience of the, of the world. And while he's doing things that we may judge in a scale from sort of, of, of dreadful to, to merely petty, um, we're, we nonetheless are uh, shown what investment he's putting into those uh, activities. And we may view that investment as sometimes as pathetic, or we may view it as at other times uh, satiric and, and, and comic. Oh, it's very funny. I mean, well, I'm, I'm thinking of that, of that one little bimbo who um, regards his, his, uh, his loft, which he's obviously decorated with great affection, yes. with antiques and and he wants to preserve the the antique quality of the beams and she says paint it all white and refers to that gorgeous chest as a, as a coffin and tries to sneak food but has no sympathy for right. his yeah for his aesthetic tastes which are a mix of um, I mean, that's the other thing. He, he's really a mass of contradictions. Well, exactly, yes. Petalova portrays him. On the one hand, he has all of this quasi-erotic art, all of these, you know, female nudes and reclining figures and bulbous hips and breasts sort mm -hmm. of surrounding him. And on the other hand, you, you frequently look at Prague through his, his eyes as this gorgeous, seductive woman. I mean, he... He really does want to climb those steps, and he does want to look out at the rooftops of Prague. Um, there's this real appreciation, which is aesthetically quite complicated, I think, but mixed in with, um, I mean, he's, he's into flesh, uh, into breasts and melons and um, well, everything of that nature. You know who he reminds me of cinematically, though, is someone like Guido in Eight and a Half. Oh, yes, very much that, so. that, you know, continually talking to himself and, you know, having an eye for... Uh, well, and it, it, is, it is true that uh, Hitzelova has, has said that one of the artists she most deeply admires uh, is Fellini. I'm not suggesting this is, in sense, imitative, but the way in which somebody like Fellini is capable in new ways of entering the subjective sphere. Which certainly happens at the end where, I mean, it could almost be a Fellini-like, you know, suddenly you move into, well, it's also a bit of Bergman. Yeah. We talked about mm -hmm. this where all of a sudden the figure of death from the seventh seal arrives, but not in black, instead in this kind of chalky white outfit. But at that moment where you step over what seems to be uh, from a realistic right. film uh, into uh, into a, a surreal nightmare, which is rather typical of some of the things Fellini has done. Well, that's one of the things, uh, uh, I, I'm in agreement with you, that one of the things I like about this film is it has a kind of sliding narration. What I mean by that is that at certain moments we're more or less allied with his subjective field and at other times not. And the film sort of drifts one way and another. Not, not by drifting, I don't mean in an unpurposeful uh, way. And she uses a variety of devices. I mean, you've, you've spoken of the soliloquizing, the way in which he does that. She certainly uses a, a certain kinds of editing to imitate 
his particular experience of events. Again, time some, is flying, and all of a sudden you get this time lapse photography that a, absolutely, looks like a nature film on the clouds, sort of soaring. Absolutely, by. she uses all these cinematic devices. Or when he steps in the doggy do, as you said, we have that rapid montage of his world going out right. of out of kilter while obviously and then that old man coming up and we're not as young as we used mm -hmm. to be yeah, it's a little fish lens like uh, look oh. at the face of the uh, no, well, once again she uses a, a high um, density of of uh, handheld shots in the film uh, and a number of those shots are directly imputed to his eyes they are optical point of view shots but then others of them are not and are just some kind of imitation of his experiential field of Prague, but at that moment, because he, he, we're yeah. on a kind of emotional roller coaster with him, and the city's I always... Know. and he's so delicate, too. I mean, he gets so, I mean, he gets so upset at the thought of even running into that old woman who will oh, tell yes. him that he's, I mean, it will just ruin his day, or if it's, it's raining, um, he's... He's sort of perpetually somewhat dis disappointed. You know, it's as though the fragility of everything going absolutely right is something he protects, heart and soul. Well, and, we, and, and that is uh, taken into consideration by our, again, by the view of his apartment, the place that he keeps perfectly ordered, that he keeps yes. in the old section of Prague, because again, it, Hitzelova in others of her films satirizes all that which is of the new or the contemporary Prague, whereas here he's trying to preserve in, in many ways in an admirable way a whole set of traditions, and yet at the same time that creates a tension with him because it puts him out of step with, for example, the young woman who comes up. Right. He's not so yeah. interested in these things. I know. Well, the second woman, too, who, um, you know, he's been seduced by watching her dancing in the, in the nude or the right. place I nude, and so then you you cut to their meeting and she arrives in that hilarious outfit which he's scandalized by it. yeah I mean she she looks as a matter of fact a little bit like um, a 60s hippie right um, and like a couple of the characters in the, the earlier Hitelova film Daisies um, and, and she belongs to that sort of hip generation while he belongs to right something gracious and older and, you know, the charming. The, the title of the film is very funny. You know, when you told me about the, the uh, late afternoon, very late afternoon of the fawn, the very late sort of accentuates the fact right. that he's left pan-like uh, foundhood well behind. And you're, the first shot you get, which is almost, uh, I mean, it's an excruciatingly tight close-up. You can see the pores in his skin. Right. And he looks like a satyr. He does not look like a fawn at all. And then you get that pan-like pipe on yes, the, the soundtrack, which it, at the beginning it has a kind of frisky quality to it, but when it recurs, it, it becomes more and more melancholy when, when he's really in his cups, when he's had a lot to drink um, and becomes melancholy because it's all sex and no love and no lasting relationships. Um, I, then wonder, he, I wonder whose fault that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And but also all of the you know all of the little remarks you know so many women and you can't make them all you know so little time. Well, one of the things that I, I think is interesting to, to then shift this overall to discussing some of the women characters as well as Prague is the way in which the world is not, for Hitelova, there's no simple, easy division between male and female. Because one of the things I like about this film is the way in which it describes a social system, uh, a sexual social system, in which all parties are complicitous. Yes, yeah. the women are quite aggressive as well. You know, even when he, he's putting the make on his friend's uh, daughter's classmate. Right. You get this very tight close-up of the woman, you know, who is holding that enormous melon <laughs> and sort of gazing back at him, you know, as though I, I, I know what you're up to and I, I will drop off that, that book. For, what's the name of the book again? Something about you and me on relationships. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, no, you're no. Right. It, 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 it's, and when he, when he g goes into the office pool and you arrive ahead of time and all the, the um, secretaries are sort of, you know, eagerly awaiting him because apparently he's going to arrive in a pink shirt. 
Um, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, if you think about this also in terms of it being a woman director, I don't think there's any privileging of the Very male gaze yeah. over the female gaze because you're really examining him with a kind of uh, scrutiny that I think, um, you know, an intimacy at, at certain points that in no way enhances his, his figure, you know, that shot of him when he's kneading his belly yes. and it's like oh my or when he's sitting on the toilet and grunting and yeah I mean it's merciless well and she does I mean one of the things I like about Hitsalova is that she's such a full filmmaker that is that she's always interested in using whatever is available uh, in cinema so uh, she'll have a shot like that of his of his stomach and she'll in one sense make a commentary on it because the young woman is talking about how her experience of going there to be seduced is of purposeful voyeurism because how do you experience flesh like that? That is, her desire can be for old flesh just as his desire yeah, can be. So it's right. a mirror image of that. And of course, she the, the, she runs out when she says, "Well, you know, what else can I do for you? I was on your bed." Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, but he, he didn't want her to arrive in well, bed quite that. I mean, well, well, because she violated his aesthetic senses. He has a protocol, right. and the protocol must be. Uh, be followed. But at the same time, you'll get that kind of commentary. Uh, she works very well with, is so very interested in visual textures. Uh, and so you, we will get the comparison through her editing of his flesh with that of the autumnal leaves themselves. And we'll, she will make that remark. And so, you know, we have the title very late, but then she makes the, without any support from dialogue or commentary, through editing, she will make that comparison. Of the uh, of the textures, well, it's also autumn. I mean, you have, uh, you know, particularly in those opening shots, yeah. the montage of the, the leaves, and you know, the the idea that time is passing becomes really almost an obsession with the poor fellow as the, as the story progresses. Um, yeah. Very late afternoon. <laughs> well, it, it's also a, a very interesting city film. That is, that this is a. Um, a film that uh, would not be the same if it were made in another city. You could transpose a lot of things. Prague is beautiful, yeah. I mean, uh, situating him against that background, I mean, it, once again, it's, it's uh, you know, the effort to really flesh out the r romanticism of a character right. with, you know, supplying shots of a city that has a kind of sense of romance to it whenever you, you look at it. Um, the, the stares that he... You know, and the young women are so unromantic where she says, you know, as long as there's ice cream nearby, I don't care. You can take me anywhere. These stairs, those stairs, or when uh, he spills ice cream on yes. that one girl who is getting her, her picture taken. Right. But then her boyfriend turns out to be an absolute... Lout? Yes. <laughs> and, you know, gives her a whack at one point, and then she whacks him back. And, you know, here's this old fellow who... Whatever his lechery, he certainly does have a sense of romance. Um, well, that's that's one know, of the complicating features right. uh, of it, and you, you you can say on the at certain moments, you know how how frivolous of him, how misdirected. Yet when you put what he's doing in contrast to what the view of some of the norms are of the sets of values, is all of this playfulness that he represents, the sort of lyric quality of the seduction yeah. that he represents, uh, that in contrast uh, to, to her view of the youthful society or a, a society that's la lost these manners and is caught up in a kind of, of, of uh, uninteresting hedonistic consumerism. Um, that, that she has an appreciation for this. And there's a, there's a certain um, pathos about the passing of this world, uh, even as there's a very accurate satiric description mm -hmm. of, its, uh, of its very limitations. Well, it, it goes along with his, his friend who mm -hmm. has managed to get married, and, and you know, when they run into each other in the, the men's room later, do you know what she wants me to do? Bathe every day! <laughs> you know, the, the loss of those good old um, bachelor days when um, you know, presumably there was a new woman around oh, yes, the corner yes, yes. every moment. But uh, toward the end, I mean, Hetalova, it, it is curious. I mean, she decides that she wants to create some sort of sense of closure yes. by introducing Vlasta as, as romantically interested in this, this fellow. A very interesting turn, yes. Yeah, I mean, and, and then, 
you know, he, even in his drunken state and even in his melancholy stupor where he seems to be longing for just the sort of relationship Vlasta um, offers him, he reverts to the idea that you can't, you can't really have a sustaining relationship with someone from your, from your office, not if you're a true ladies' man. It would violate that. The, the proprieties of being a ladies man. Well, and we see this as, you know, as extraordinarily cruel on his part, though following his principles, that we have seen him do something now that really has hurt somebody that we do, do not wish to see hurt. But of course, in turn, the, the interesting thing there is that one treatment of this could be, you know, that you just leave her with a, with a kind of shot of her weeping in the corner or something, something like that. But in fact, she's active <laughs> in her response because she, she knows revenge. she knows exactly what she can do um, to fight back since he has turned on her in this preposterous way after she's opened herself up. And so, uh, you know, in comes the, um, the, the angel of death, uh, um, complete with sunglasses and a uh, little black coffin to drive him, drive him off with. Let's talk about uh, Hitzelova in slightly more, more, more general terms. Okay. One of the things that, that you've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about, teaching about, and reading about is uh, women filmmakers, um, both from the, the differences of their personalities, their artistic styles, but also their cultural and historical context. What m makes Hitzelova, uh, to, to your mind, you know, now you're going to ask me a really hard question. No, well, of course. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's um, towards the end of the hmm. show, you know. Right. But, but um, why wouldn't she be an American director? That's one question. Oh. Or, 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 is that, or, you know, is that a, a well, worthwhile I, question? Well, I would, I mean, I would definitely classify her as a European filmmaker. Um, she, she's not going for the broad effect, the, the immediate impact. I mean, this is a very subtle and okay. elaborate characterization. Um, I think what distinguishes her as a, a European woman filmmaker, and now I'm really going out on a limb, is her, um, I mean, it's almost a lack of political interest in this fellow. I mean, she, I, don't, I don't think that she has any political access to grind from a feminist right. standpoint. I'm thinking of someone like Marlene Goris. Um, she is, she's not going for the jugular when she really could. I mean, yes. you have the sense throughout of an extremely mature sensibility, uh, intellectually uh, quite astute, and, and she's not going after this guy, although he's obvious. I mean, you could say that he is a parasite on the culture. I mean, he doesn't do anything. Right. I mean, he's basically an embellishment, and he belongs to an older world that's fast fading and whose charm is fading with it. Right. But she doesn't even, I mean, there's a sense of the irony and the satire, but there's a kind of melancholy sympathy for that. Yes. And so that she doesn't have, um, she doesn't have that kind of political um, uh, harshness, which I think is um, both justified, but also, um, you know, something that women directors feel that they almost have to engage in in order to... Um, separate themselves off as as directors well, from their male colleagues. Th that's also one of the um, um, points that she's brought up in interviews of of the fact uh, of two things. First of all, that she felt great solidarity with a lot of the people she went to film school with. That is, Men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and who were, right. it was a generational and purposeful solidarity that we mm -hmm. were being trained by the same people to be the same kind of oppositional force within, within the society. So to, to her, observing all of these gender issues was something they were all going to be, uh, all going to be doing, and she didn't feel it would be on one side or another, except on the critical side of looking what these mechanisms are. The second thing is that she's, she's stated again, she's really quite resistant to, to uh, external models of what a woman filmmaker should be, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sh should be doing. Uh, she is a extraordinarily and well known to be a strong uh, character, a strong presence who is not going to take other people's definitions. Mm -hmm. I believe that she should be responsible for constructing her own art and her own, uh, you know, right. uh, image, uh, image as an artist. Um, you and I were talking a little bit before the show about uh, uh, Hitzelova's 
perhaps her most famous film. That is the film that really made her overall international reputation uh, is Daisies, mm -hmm. uh, made in the mid-60s, an extraordinary film uh, in, in a whole set of ways. But uh, this is a film made 15 to 20 years after uh, daisies. What do you see as some of the key differences between something like daisies made in the mid 60s and something like this made in the ma mid 80s for viewing Hitalova as an artist? Well, I think uh, daisies, I think, reflects um, uh, the period in which it was made. It has a kind of 60s feel to it. Um, it reminds you of some of the pacing in those Beatles films, right. um, kind of raucous hip. Um, quality, the characterizations are flippant. Um, it's almost a too cool to um, uh, and careless attitude uh, toward um, an older generation. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking particularly in the opening, the way they treat that that poor fellow in the restaurant <laughs> where, you know, I mean, the, the girl uh, friend arrives and proceeds to order this elaborate meal and to stuff. Right. Um, and uh, a kind of careless attitude, which I think uh, is very different from this, yes. this much later film. This later film has, I prefer the later film. It may okay. reflect my own aging attitude towards youth, but it, it has a kind of maturity to it. Um, the sensibility seems more generous, um, uh, more wide-ranging, um, more sympathetic with the characterizations. Um, and it's not as flashy. Um, I mean, she uses a lot of, of interesting uh, camera movements, the handheld camera, but also the, the, uh, the editing sequence, for example, when they're, they've gone to, um, to listen to... Um, uh, Vivaldi? Vivaldi. Yes. And you're getting uh, that montage of the woman he's sitting with over wine in some sort of wine bar, and, and you're seeing her in a, a series of, of uh, gestures, which I assume are from his point of view. You know, her exquisiteness is yes. being emphasized. So she's quite capable of doing some of the things she did in, in the earlier work, but it seems less a, a kind of showy watch me what I can do, and much more to enhance in this instance um, the subjectivity, the interiority of the character that she's trying to create. Um, well, that... and she's also, no, she's also, uh, one of the things is she's linked with, actually with story here, because when she, mm -hmm. in, in, in Daisy's... Daisy's story be damned. <laughs> yeah. No, there's lots of well, objects of ridicule and, and this right. and that, but, but for that to be linked together as story is not something, is something right. she's not interested in. Whereas it seems here, improvisational, extemporaneous. It's like, I've created a couple characters, let's see what they can do, you know, let them make their own story. It has a kind of Godard feel to it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and this one, uh, I, we, let's hope it's not very late in the career of uh, Vera Hitalova, yeah. but it is. it does have that late... Well, how many films does she make after... Well, she's uh, she, she's made three or four feature-length mm -hmm. films uh, since then. Something that we'll be looking looking into. We're now very late in oh, the, in, the, in the in the program, so I need to talk to our viewers just for a okay. second. If you'd like more information about City Cinematheque, drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York 10036. Let me give you that information again. Drop a line to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Linda, thanks for coming in and giving us your insights on this. It'll always be a pleasure to have you back on City Cinematheque. Okay. No more hard questions. <laughs> no more hard questions. But we hope you keep pondering the hard questions at home and join us again on City Cinematheque. Thanks for joining us today.
The preceding presentation of City Cinema Tech was made possible in part by the cooperation of the Czech Center of New York, the National Film Archives, Prague, and the State Fund for Cinematography of the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic.